managers. Uh, it's a part of the business where we have to, do, or when sellers sell a property, um, we use these documents and disclose it to our potential buyers. Um, any, and we'll, we'll go through it. We're going to go ahead and share our screen here and uh, let's jump right into it. Let me say, got it. So who knows what seller disclosures are? Me. Right. Um, for the people that don't know, um, there are a few specific and standard seller disclosures. Um, right now, we're going to jump right into it. These are what we utilize, especially when we're going on offer consults, even prior before checking the property. Um, what I generally like to do is always gather the disclosures just so I have a reference point as to what to look, what to look out for. If I am touring that property with my client, I already, I already know pretty much everything about it. And then we go sit down on the offer table and we disclose this to our clients. We know exactly what's going on with the property. Um, so jumping into what the preliminary title report is. Who knows what a prelim is? All right, we have a few people who knows what a prelim, preliminary title report is. So by definition, a preliminary title report is a report prepared prior to issuing a policy of title insurance that shows the ownership of a specific parcel of land together with liens and encumbrances thereon, which will not be covered under a subsequent title insurance policy. This also includes easements. Um, who knows what easements are? Got it. So we got a few people that know what easements are. Zahara, you want to go into a little bit of what an easement is? Yeah. Well, you just, you jumped right into that. <laughs> um <laughs> Yeah, I, I can say if we could backtrack too. I do want to point out like there's two sides of disclosures that we're going to talk about today. One is like specific disclosures because there are going to be a lot of disclosures that come alongside in a disclosure package and some are going to be very specific to that property. And then some are going to be standard disclosure that are going to come with any sale of any property, right? So it, we're the only ones we're going to get into today are the specific ones because these ones are going to really get... Um, specific as the name is for that certain property. So like AJ is saying in the prelim, um, an easement is essentially an encroachment or um, a use of a part of a land that somebody has access to. So we need to make our clients aware of these things and where you find this is on the prelim. So it'll tell you like, um, it'll come with a map and it'll tell you a description of where that somebody has access to that piece of land. And in certain circumstances or, or most circumstances, those easements also cannot be built on. So it is a big thing that we need to make our clients aware of. If like there's a you know 10 foot wide easement in the running through the middle of their backyard, that's really important for them to know before they purchase that house because it can affect desirability of them even wanting to own that house if they can never build something on that part of their own land. Exactly. Any questions? And another example. Um, I think Maudie had one, but another quick example of what an easement can be is let's say you're sharing a driveway and a person's house is behind your house, but they have to utilize your driveway, right? That is also an easement. Um, Maudie, you had some uh, quick question? Well, I was going to say, yes, you give examples of easements, but another one is uh, utility poles. Those Ut are very common. Utility yeah. poles. Um, so like PG&E yeah. usually has access to those. Um, and those things will be disclosed in the preliminary title report. Um, jumping on to the TDS, um, a TDS is a transfer disclosure statement. Now, what is a transfer disclosure statement? So this is something, it's another seller disclosure. Um, it's California law requires that potential buyers must be informed of any major defects in a property that they're considering purchasing. Defects are included in the transfer disclosure statement that sellers must complete and provide to buyers under California law. Sellers should update their statements if anything occurs to change the property's condition between the time of submitting the TDS and the time of closing. The statement should include the condition of any appliance or other items in the home that are included in the sale. Right. I can give you a quick example of what a TDS looks like, and I'll go ahead and pull it up here. Oh, wait. It's going to be difficult for me to actually display it on the screen. I can go ahead and share it right after. We'll kind of go through it, um, unless I can try and share it right now, but I know it's a hard sharing. Zara, do you have a TDS that you can quickly pull up? Yeah, I also stopped sharing. If you have one that you could start sharing now. Okay, yeah, I'll go ahead and share one real quick. Oops, those are notes.
Hello, everyone. <laughs> Chameleon. Welcome to. Let me share my screen. Go this way for everybody to see. I can see it before now. I can't see it. Well, I it's going to be hard because, like, if I want to show it on like the big screen where everybody's looking, then it's kind of either one side. Or on the, on the, do you guys think it's easier if I share it on the big screen, or you guys are just online and then we share it on the Zoom screen? Right. I think you have to share it on Zoom, cool. AJ, for Thanks. the recording. It is being shared on Zoom. It looks like if I if I bring it to this screen, now you guys can all see it, right? Yeah. Now. Yeah. Okay. So, um, in short, this is what a TDS real estate transfer disclosure statement looks like. This lets us know what is on the property for the most part, right? So for this specific property, it's just gonna let us know, is it a public sewer system? Is there a sprinkler? Is there a water supply? Basic basic things that should generally be in a house, the seller is gonna disclose this to us just oh, so we know. We can always, we can reference, always reference this and be like, oh, well, you know, does this house have a washer and dryer? Does it have a washer and dryer hookup? We can relay that back to the transfer disclosure statement to confirm that that's something available. Now, in terms of this here, these are questions that they ask the seller, anything that the seller may be aware of on the property, things such as like we talked about, is there any easements on the home? Has there been any structural room modifications on the property? Generally, for the most part, they, they usually are no, but if in the event that they are yes, there has to be an example or there has to be a reasoning or an example um, described on this bottom part here. And for the most part, if the definition of why it's denoted yes, um, there will be an addendum that states a longer list of why, and I can show you guys that after. So for this specific property, was there any rooms, structural, uh, structural modifications and alterations made with necessary permits? Yes, there was. If we look down here, if the answer is yes, see additional sheets if necessary, the sheet will then be provided below. Um, going on to this part here, any settling, any cause of damage? Yes, soil problems, um, any zoning violations, non-conforming uses, violation of setback requirements. So if we go down here, right here is where they give us the definition of those things. Buyer to verify all plans, permits, since the seller, et cetera, et cetera. This is where you would find it. Now, going on to the seller's property questionnaire, Zahar, if you want to go back to your screen there. We're going to talk about what an SEQ is. Okay, an SPQ is the seller's property questionnaire. Now, this is not a substitute for the transfer disclosure statement. It is used by the seller to provide any more additional information when a TDS is completed. Um, generally, a lot of times, if you're working with a seller, they complete the TDS first, then follow up with the SPQ. Um, and this is what's disclosed in the first sentence. Now, what happened? On the last sentence, um, what they reference that's heavily important if you are working with sellers, if you, do not, if you do not understand how to answer any of these questions or what to disclose or how to make a disclosure in a response to a question, whether on this form or the TDS, you should consult with a real estate attorney in California for your choosing. Um, now, if I was to jump back into what an SPQ looks like, it looks very similar to a TDS. Um, I'll go ahead and share what the seller's property quer property questionnaire that I have. I'll go ahead and share my screen again, Zahara. Uh, do you want me? To, I'll just pull one up because it's gonna get. Okay. Yeah, you can just pull one up so it's easier. Give us a second, Chris. Now, does everybody in this room know what a preliminary title report and what a transfer disclosure statement? Do you guys know what they are for and what they're utilized for and what they reference? Okay, so this is an SPQ, right? A seller's property questionnaire, similar to the TDS, but should not be utilized as a substitute. Some of the, it, it, it has the same type of point where 
the seller will be asked these questions, but things that are included, like, was there a death on the property? Was the property, is it affected by a nuisance created in an industrial zone? Uh, the same thing that happens is if these are notated as yes, there has to be an explanation as to why it's a yes. Now, as of right now, all of them are no, but we do have a few. Now, if we go to repairs and alterations, any alterations, modifications, um, it does reference that there has been modifications on the property, whether the property was built before 1978 um, and any of the property being painted in the last 12 months. Now, we can go ahead and continue going down. Is there any pets, animals, water-related uh, mold issues, disaster relief? It's a whole bunch of questions that a seller must disclose if they know the reasoning as to why they must disclose it honestly, right? Now, if we go a little bit more down, it's just another series of questions, governmental questions, any other reports, is there any liens on a property? Um, the seller must legally disclose these to the best of their ability in all honesty. Does everybody know what an SBQ is now? Yes. We good there? Mm -hmm. So guys, just keep in mind, these forms, like I said, they're very specific to the property in question. And the seller's, due to, the seller's duty to the transaction is to be honest and disclose anything that they know that could potentially affect the desirability of the property in question. So keep in mind, guys, um, if, if you guys put an offer on a home and you go non-contingent and the seller is missing any of these disclosures and then they are given to you while you are in escrow, that actually opens up your um, contingency period and it will give you an automatic five days to go ahead and assess the new information that was given to you and then decide if you still want to follow through with that contract or not. So just a tip of some stuff that we utilize when we see some of these documents are missing because that can just be a way for you to sneak your non-contingent offer in, but then still get time to do your due diligence. Next one. Exactly, uh, exactly. Natural hazard disclosure, AJ, we skipped over that one. Yeah, so I'll go over the natural hazard and disclosure report. Um, uh, NHD, in short, uh, is a report, is your chance to inform your buyers of any risks involved in purchasing your home. Um, if you disclose that your home sits in an area prone to earthquakes, wildfires, for instance, you shouldn't be liable if your buyer were to purchase this and see it destroyed by an earthquake or engulfed by a fire, as you are disclosing that this can be a natural disaster that happens in that area. Now, the NHD report shows whether a property lies within any of the six common hazard zones present in this area. This report is required to disclose any special flood hazard zones, dam inundation, very high fire, wildland fire, earthquake, vaults, earthquake fault zones, and seismic hazard areas. These reports often include supplemental hazards as well, such as proximity to environmental concerns, um, whether the property lies within an airport influence area or military ordinance zone. Um, also, they can include Megan's Law, indicating where there may be a sex offender that lives in the area. This is something that may also be included. Now, what's the importance of having an NHD aside from just disclosing all of these to your buyers? Right. For a lot of times it could do with insurance. Right. Then we'll know. Well, we're in a high flood zone. Um, a lot of properties in Santa Cruz. Right. Those areas fall within high fire zones. Right. A lot of properties along the Hayward fault line have seismic activity earthquake zones. Right. These are things that we should be disclosing to our buyers. Right. Because in the event that something is going to happen, well, I didn't know that this I did had to get this fire insurance. I didn't know it was going to have fires on my property. Did we go over the NHD report with them? Right. Well, how, a lot of people, a lot of questions that I get, like, why am I, why do I have a high uh, flood, flood risk? I'm in San Jose, I'm in Sunnyvale, right? But there are a lot of dams in the area, right? Uh, Morgan Hill, there's a giant lake. My, my client's like, Morgan Hill, it's all, it's all dead grass and, and dirt here, right? Beautiful property, but there is a very large lake in that area, right? So we have to disclose that type of information to their clients. Now, in the event of the natural disaster, we're not saying that it's going to be a common thing that happens all the time. But if we're referencing to our buyers, this is a possibility. I just want to let you know that this is a possibility that can happen in your subject property. We just want to let you know that. And I have one showing behind you, AJ. Oh, nice. You want to go over that, Zara? 
No, it's just an example. I mean, I just want, if you guys have never seen a natural hazard disclosure, this is how specific it gets. They give you a map, they give you all of these different um, natural hazards that it is or is not in those zones. And it shows you where the subject property is, where it lies within. Another um, critical part of the natural hazard disclosure is you can also refer to this document to find out about what special um, tax assessments that the property falls within, any Melarus taxes. It also gives you a property tax and a supplemental uh, property tax uh, calculator so that your clients are fully aware and know what to expect and they're not surprised by any bills that they get you know, moving forward after they close on the home. Exactly. And, and one of the one of the key things that I like to utilize is this while referencing this is, you know, a lot of our clients, they may be weary of noise, right? Like, oh, how close am I to an industrial zone, a gas line area? Like, how far is the airport? That's the number one question I get. Some of the things that may pop up is there a train nearby, right? Um, and a lot of times when you look at this map, it'll show you where these things, where these places are located, right? A lot of the times our clients want to know, like, how far am I from the airport? Why are there always planes flying over my head? Well, Mr. Customer, there's an airport located about half a mile from here, right? So you're not directly in front of the airport, but we want to make sure that you're aware that the likelihood of an airplane flying over your house, we can show you with this NHD report. Cool. What else do we have on that list, Zahara? Next would be... Okay. Yeah, HOA docs, if applicable. Obviously, if it's a single family, more often than not, there's not an HOA involved, but there can be at times. Um, but if you're looking at condo townhouse, they're always going to have an HOA. And so all of the HOA docs will also be included in the disclosure package. Um, and if you don't get them right away, again, that is something that you are due from by the sellers. So keep an eye out for those. I do have one thing to add on to HOA documents, right? Um, so we do also sell a lot of uh, townhouse and condominiums, right? What HOA docs provide for us are CCNRs and bylaws, covenants, conditions, and restrictions, right? What's, an, what's, a, what's a question that we get asked a lot as realtors is, oh, can I rent out this property? Can I lease this property to somebody else? That's where you'll find the answer. You'll figure out what the restrictions are on the unit, right? And a lot of times it can be percentage-based. And you'll find all of that. When I say percentage based is sometimes there's a maximum capacity for a complex, whether it's 70% owner occupied, 30% as rental units. You can find this information in the bylaws and the CCNRs, as well as contacting the HOA as well, if you want to take that a little bit step further. But that information should be provided here, right? This is where you want to look if a lot of the clients that we get they, oh, I'm looking for a flatmate. Hey, I want to rent out this property. Are there any rental restrictions for this home? And you can also find the answers as to what a client can and can't do, right? Well, I'm, you know, I want to be a barber at my house, right? Well, sometimes there may be rulings where you can't run a business out of your property. You can't have any marketing outside your home, no flyers, no pictures, no signs. Um, these are things that are all included in HOA documents that you guys should always ask your clients prior to helping them buy a house hey, did you guys have any questions that you guys might want to do with your property? I'll go ahead and look into the HOA docs to be able to try and confirm this for you, whether this is something we can do or whether this is something we can't do. This question 100% will come up all the time while working with clients looking to purchase townhouse and condos. As well as pets, AJ, um, everything about yeah. what they can and cannot have in their home, pets included. I think that's a big one for a lot of people. They want to make sure that they're furry friends can come along with them and live in their new property. Um, and then also the HOA will also, the HOA docs will also include information about how the reserves are funded within that community. So that's another big one is we wanna make sure that our clients are buying into healthy HOA communities where they're gonna have enough money to fix anything that the HOA is responsible. So things on the exterior, the roads, the roofs, the termite work, anything of that nature, the pools, the, the, the common areas, we wanna make sure that the HOA has enough money. Otherwise, your client could potentially get hit with special assessments where they're gonna to have to come up with large lump sums of cash to go ahead and, you know, as owners all come together and pay for those things. Exactly, exactly, good point there. Um, so jumping into the next part, property inspection. Does everybody know what a property inspection is, right? Now, what a property inspection does is a general scope as, well, as to when a property inspector goes out to the property and obviously inspects it. Then they give us these documents and 
what we have to do is we have to go through this with our clients to disclose any structural defects on the home, not even just structural defects, anything that may be wrong with the property, any updates they have done with the property, things that may, uh, may or may not be permitted with the home. These are the things that are going to be found throughout the property inspection, and they'll usually notate as to either what the cost can be, what should be, what should be the immediate repair, is it a recommendation to repair, is it a safety issue, um, some common things that we kind of see, oh, perfect, is, is generally they give you a table of contents, just as Zahara has here, and you want to go through every single one of these with your client, right? In terms of the roofing, there is another roof report, which we'll go over later, but a lot of property inspectors, to the best of their abilities, will try and inspect the roof, Right? Sometimes they have a long pole, sometimes they have a camera, whatever they can do, but there are specific contractors, there are specific inspectors that do inspect roof. So this is a supplement to that. Right Now, another thing that happens too is they check um, the exterior of the property, they check the interior of the property, as we're seeing here right now, they're checking the exterior, they're checking the chimney, they're checking the siding. Um, some things that they'll denote as well is if the siding needs repair. A lot of times if they're going to also denote if there's cracks in the windows, if there's cracks on the stucco, right? They'll go ahead and let us know because one of the questions we get all the time as realtors is, hey, this stucco is cracking. Is, you know, is my found, is my house falling apart? When with the knowledge that we have, that doesn't always indicate a structural, that the property is going to fall apart. Um, they denote stains on the walkways, cracks in the walkways. They look at the driveway. They pretty um, much get into detail about everything, guys. Um, these inspections yeah. here are to, to disclose, you know, the condition of the home at the time of purchase. And it's for your clients to make a decision what they're comfortable taking on and having some understanding before they get into this property of like what, what potential costs are going to be, what kind of things need repair, what the shape of the roof is, the foundation, the interior, the cosmetic stuff, the non-cosmetic stuff. All these inspections get really, really specific, guys. And the, and keep in mind, you're going to see different things on every inspection. No two home, they're all like snowflakes, right? They're all going to have different issues. So, you know, it's really hard to just say this is what's on it, this is what's not. But just, I think a good reference point is this table of contents, guys, because it shows you how in depth they get with everything. They look at the plumbing, the electrical, everything within the house. That's just the property inspection. Um, the next one that we look at would be they have, you know, we have people come out and do pest inspections and we provide that as well. Um, AJ, you want to cover what the pest inspection goes into? Yeah. So with a pest inspection, it, it's essentially it, it's another inspector, but these ones are for looking for dry rot fungus, any sort of pest. What what can pests be? Subterranean termites, dry wood termites, um, things such as is there any vermin activity? Is there any rodents on a, in a home? Right now they survey the property and they give you another list of recommended repairs that should be done in a home. Right. Generally on pest reports and what they're going to have is section one and section two items. So if we go on to here with a complete report, go down a little bit, Zahara. This is probably not the best one because there was really so nothing I, here. <laughs> the house yeah. is pretty clean. So a lot of times, um, if a lot of times is we're, it's very, very, it's pretty rare to find a property that doesn't have any pest or dry rot or any fungus. Um, but in the event that the property and pest report does have it, usually there is a bid for the repairs on the bottom, right? There's usually a bid for the repairs on the bottom that one. you should. Okay, so perfect. Um, I'll utilize this one. So as you guys can see on the screen here, there are a whole bunch of numbers, right? What, what do these numbers mean? Right? They're just all over the house. These numbers notate a specific area on the pest report that will give you where these are located and as to what they what need repairs need to be done. So if we go down and see here, so 1A, right? Infestation by drywood termites was noted at the sub area, exterior and garage extending to inaccessible areas. So if you go up back to Zahara, um, back onto the property. So if we look for 
Where's 1A? If we look at 1A, it's denoting this note here. It's specifying that 1A is included into the reasoning on the bottom here. Now, the way that I generally like to look at these and what you should be doing if you are telling your buyer about this property is I look at what the cost is on the bottom and then I help reference these points to them. Hey, there's uh, Eves and Fossils on this property. If you look at the section one items, the total section one items for this specific home was $6,890 in repairs. Now, if you go, if, if you look at the prices here, I always go through each individual one of these pricing. So the no, my clients, I can say, hey, one of the biggest things is getting that 1A fixed in the garage, right? Then I'll go down to the 1F. Hey, 1F denotes this reasoning here. This is the cost for that, right? One so thing I want to note. Always go. Go ahead. One thing I want to note, guys, is in a property inspection, there will there will not be a bid for work to be completed. Um, it's kind of a conflict of interest. We don't want the property inspectors mm -hmm. going out there and saying a whole bunch of stuff doesn't work when it does or it may. Um, but for the pest and the roof inspection, there will be bids for the work to be completed. So it's a, it's helpful with your clients on these two reports because you can reference the exact cost. But it's our job to help them figure out how much of the property inspection of what that's gonna cost them. And that's where we rely on our, you know, referral partners like Jim and, and some of the other contractors that we work with, or even the inspector himself, like we work with Mario a lot. They can help shed some insight as to how costly these things are gonna be for our clients. And again, that's where we show our value guys is because we see these all day long. You guys will start to get familiar with how much it might be to replace um, the roof or, you know, get some of this work done, whatever it may be, change out an electrical panel, things of that nature. But, you know, it's your guys' job, I think, to be fact finders and, and to be solution based agents and help them figure these things out so that they can factor these works that need to be completed into their offer price and feel comfortable going into that property based on the amount of information that we've been given. AJ, can I add it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. go ahead. So usually when I go through the pest inspection, I will always go through the bids at the end first, just yeah. to let them know how much it is. I explain anything under 5,000 is very normal. Even if you get a fix, you'll probably have it again within two years. And you got to think about it because it's mostly external work and you have rain. So water and wood will equal damage, even if you fix it. Now, anything over five to 10 is still normal, but it just means things are uh, leaking inside the home. Anything over 10, it's always internal damage, things they just never cared about. So you want to go through it like that. I don't want to go too in-depth because then it scares them, especially first-time home buyers. And then you also want to go through what is a section one and section two. Section two is something that will lead to section one. I say, for example, if there's a hole in your shower, it's section two, but if you don't fix it, it will turn into section one. Exactly. Exactly. Now, um, you made a really good point, right? It, it's it's really disclosing and really knowing. And, you know, we've been in the business, so we understand, like, is $5,000. As a buyer, you're like, oh, $5,000, that's a lot. But it's pretty common for us to see $5,000 worth of damage, termite damage on a property, right? I can say that because I've looked at hundreds and thousands of inspection reports, termite reports, right? But as you mentioned, once you start getting up in price, it's your job to be, what Zahara said, a fact finder, be able to you know, tell them, oh, no, well, you got to do it this way. This is what has to be done. Why is this section two? Why is this section one? So huge point there. Appreciate that, Thomas. Going on to the roof inspection. Um, wait, did we skip the roof inspection? Yeah, we're, roof inspection's next. But with the roof inspection, I find this to be one of the most important ones because a lot of our clients, right, that purchase single families, the roof is one of the biggest ticket items you can. You guys good? Um, the roof, the roof is one of the biggest ticket items on a house, right? Now, generally, if you know the idea of what a roof can cost, it it gives you a little bit more tools under your belt, what the composition of the roof is. Are they shingles? Are they tiles? Are they concrete? All that stuff is great knowledge to know. Now, what a roof inspection is, is, can you pull that up, Zahara? I'm looking for one. Okay, I found one.
So here we have a home guard incorporated roof inspection report. What these disclose is to the best of their knowledge, to the best of their abilities, these roof inspectors will go out there, tell you what the, what the age of the roof is if the seller doesn't know, to the best of their abilities. They may not be spot on every time, but they will disclose as to how best they can, right? They'll also tell you how they saw the roof, the pipes, the vents, the flashing, um, how, what is the slope, what is the grade of the roof? And if we see here, the main roof is a dimensional style composition single gray in color. The number of roof layers is unknown. The estimate, this is the biggest key part that you guys have to look for that a lot of our clients ask. Um, the estimated remaining serviceable life of the roof is 10 to 15 years, right? The pitch of the roof seems to be 412. The overall condition of the roof is good, right? This is the number one thing that I disclose always to my clients because if you're gonna fix a roof and the roof's in pretty bad shape, look at this cost right now. It's only four, it's only $485 to fix the recommended repairs of the findings here, right? But Sometimes if the roof is about oh, one to two years old left, always keep in mind that sometimes roof, replacing a whole roof can cost anywhere sometimes between 15 to $30,000 for a full re-roofing. And it's, you have to disclose this to your clients because you don't want them moving into the property. You didn't disclose that the roof needed a repair and then they have a leak, right? Then they're saying, well, how much is it to repair the roof? And then you hit them with, oh, it's around like 30 grand, right? So always go through the roof report, right? Because as Thomas said, these are things that can lead to potential larger things. Right now it looks fine, right? But let's say in five, 10 years, they don't maintain the roof and it starts leaking, right? So always notate to your clients, this is the expected remaining serviceable life of the roof, right? This is what I want you guys to know. Or a lot of times it's the roof is brand new. We just replaced the roof, right? And that's great. Um... Zahar, you want to go over to the AVID? Yeah. And keep in mind, guys, this is not like there are going to be variables where this is not the end all be all list, right? If there's a pool, then there's going to be a pool inspection. Like we have to keep in mind, this is just generally the most common disclosures that we we're dealing with, but there are going to be times where there are more disclosures even than this. Um, but this is like the bare minimum. The AVID or the agent visual inspection disclosure, there will be one done by the listing agent. And there will be one done by you as the buyer's agent or whoever you're representing. There will be two AVIDs total before the escrow closes. This is where we as agents will go out and we will look for any visual defects that we see and note them. That's from you know the entryway to the interior, to the bedrooms, to the bathrooms, to the exterior, to the garage. Now we are not recommending repairs. We are not saying what the cause of these things is. We are simply noting anything again of the condition of the home that may be negative or perceived as something wrong with the home. Uh, a lot of agents do their habits incorrectly and they'll go through and they'll write brand new carpet and uh, beautiful window trims. Like, no, we don't do that. We're going there to write only what is wrong with the property. If there's a stain on the floor, if there's a broken hole in the window, if there's a scratches on the baseboards, paint imperfections, holes in the walls, we wanna make notes of that. Because again, that's really useful for us at the beginning of our escrow to know what the condition of the home is versus when we're about to close, hand off the keys and we're looking at the wall like, was there this big water stain on it before? Like it's, we have to be very thorough in our observations. Exactly. Um, I did want to bring up the chat. Um, Kat did have a question. Do all disclosure forms come from the seller and listing agent? Tony then replied, all sellers disclosures are provided by the listing agent. Inspection reports are optional, but we see most of the sellers in Santa Clara, Alameda County, they are providing those, right? So as Tony said, a huge, a huge thing here right now is the inspection reports those are optional. They're not on every property. You're not going to find them on every property, right? So they're an optional thing that the sellers can provide to the buyers. In the outer areas, like Modesto, Tracy, they don't provide. All yeah. So, policy. and so, so, so Alexa Lee and Mauricio said something else is generally sometimes, and I know I've encountered in like San Joaquin Valley yeah. um, and places like Hollister, the sellers aren't, aren't providing, right? So your buyer can come so, in. And so Alessandra asked, like, what do you do in that, in that event? So now your buyers can come in. Hey, you can reach out to the listing. Gate. Are your sellers doing inspections on the home? No, we're not doing that. Okay. <laughs> then your buyer can come in with a buyer's inspection contingency and get an inspection done on the property. 
Exactly. No, I was just going to add to that. Like in Hollister, it's, it's common practice for the buyer to do their inspections. So most offers always come in with an inspection contingency at least, right? Uh, Santa Clara County, just because things move way too fast, it's already done ahead of time, yeah. right? But it's common practice, at least in Hollister, for sellers not to do inspections and there's inspection contingency, but it's, it's a totally different pace. Cool. Yeah, it really depends on um, the yeah. I always tell my buyers too on the buyer's consultation that we do with our clients, I'm always warning, I'm always telling them, hey, look, more than I'm explaining these contingencies, I say, hey, more often than not, sellers in our area are very proactive and they're providing these inspections. But in the event that they don't, those are what the contingencies are there for, guys. And lastly, the way that I want to kind of leave off, I know we're a little bit over time, is like this this is something that 100 percent always has to be done right in today's market and how we're writing offers and stuff like this it is our job to make sure that the client is confident in writing the offer the client is comfortable with the disclosures that they're given the client understands what they're given because you don't want to all of a sudden send them a disclosures package with 37 documents 508 pages and you're going to say hey guys i sent you the disclosure package let me know your thoughts Right. I don't think if you had 500 pages to read and buying a house, you'd be like, what, the, I, 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 what, what did I just what did I just go through? Right. So it's our job to break it down. Right. Give them an understanding and make sure that they're comfortable. Tommy, did you have something? Yeah. So when I send out disclosure packages, I explain it as 95 percent of these are FYI documents and 5 percent will be ones that vary. And the first time we'll go through every single document together because you can't expect your client to spend five hundred thousand or a million dollars and not know what it's talking about. But every time after, we'll only go through TDS, SVQ, NHD, and inspections. We're not gonna waste any time. I don't know if you guys covered, but on the NHD, there's two zones that 95% of the Bay Area is in. It's dam indonation mm -hmm. and liquefaction. Dam indonation is if a dam fails, it could flood. Liquefaction, I explained it as our soil here is rich of sand, so it does move over time, which could cause foundation. And a big part is the whole area used to be orchards but those two don't infect, affect your home insurance. Solid. That's good. There's a lot of things so, guys, that you guys need to be reading through these disclosures and get familiar with. This is a very, very like high level overview of all of these disclosures. Um, it's, it's really your guys' job to start getting familiar with all of these forms and going through and reading them. There's so many disclosure packages available for all these properties online. You can simply go into the MLS and download one for any property and start reading them and getting familiar with the forms. Or if you want to reach out to Andre and uh, Adriana, they can probably give you blank forms as well that if you want to just go and read the standard ones. Um, the ones that we covered first half were the specific ones. So again, these are the ones like Thomas said, we'll spend more time going through them with our clients because because they're specific to that home. The rest, I call them boilerplate disclosures. No matter what house you guys buy, these are gonna be a party to the transaction. They're just like he said, FYI, you need to know this stuff. Here's a list of some of the, like some of the many, I'm sure that there's more than this, depending on what city or county you buy in, sometimes they require more stuff. So again, you guys just keep in mind, like if you hand over a disclosure package to your clients without guiding them through this, they're gonna be like, WTF, this is a lot of information. They're not gonna know how to digest it. So even when I first send them over, I'll even point out, I'll tell them the names of the ones that are more specific to the property. And I'll say, hey, these are the ones that are very specific. These are the ones that are just a party to all transaction, all real estate transactions. Um, keep in mind, guys, these ones, I do still want you guys to go there and read them. They're very like short forms, very basic, very just informational. Um, you guys should go and read through all of these so that you are aware of you know, every disclosure that goes on with every property. And just to leave off with that, it's, I know that you guys should, you guys have to, right? And the reason being is these all come with a, with a real estate transaction, right? Your clients will have to sign some of these documents, right? And you don't want to come up to a point where they're trying to sign one of these documents. I can never went over this, right? Can you go through this? Right. So it's always you, you, you should, but you you have to go over these documents. You need to understand these documents just for yourself. And if a client decides to ask you, you obviously have to know this. Right. And you have to be able to describe it. So one more thing, I want to add you guys, one of Mel <laughs> Melissa New's job, the one that we charge out, you know, the fee to the clients to go ahead and take care of the 
the document transactions, she's going to be at one point or another docu signing all of these disclosures to your client. So again, this is even a better sales you know, pitch when we're talking about her is like, there are so many legally required sellers disclosures that have to be given to you as a buyer to protect you and to inform you. And on the flip side, if we're representing the seller, we can also say, hey, look, she's going to make sure that you guys give all these documents and you fill them out properly. So you are disclosing in a high level legal manner and protecting you from liability from the buyer coming back at you and saying, hey, you didn't tell us this or you left out this piece of information. So it's to protect everybody, guys. And, and just keep that in mind. Melissa's doing a lot of this in the back end for us, but it's your job to be an expert at what these forms are. Because yes, you will get that call one day where they're like, hey, Zahara, can you explain to me the statewide buyer and seller advisory? And it's our job to tell them what they're signing because nobody wants to sign a document that they don't know what's on it. So exactly, right? Huge takeaway right there. Right. They're going to have to sign these eventually. And you don't want them coming back and be like, what am I signing this for? Right. And like Zahara said, you have to be the expert and to be able to acknowledge, confirm, repeat and describe what they're signing. Right. I know I know all of you guys in this room wouldn't sign something if you had no idea what was on it. And you got to remember, too, we're selling these clients multi-million dollar houses. Right. This is one of the biggest transactions of their life. It's it's their right to know exactly what's going on and exactly what they're signing. And we're the experts so that's going to let them know what it is. So cool, guys. That concludes the training. I appreciate all of you guys here. I hope that was in, uh, incredibly helpful. I know it's not the, the pretty part of the business. I know it's not the fun part of the business to read all these stuff, but, but it, it's, it's crucial, it's critical, and it also protects us as agents. And more importantly, it protects our buyers and sellers. So appreciate you guys. Um, thank you. Thank you, Zahara. Um, and we'll leave it at that. Good job, guys. Thanks, guys.